Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY, called Human Rights Chapter Six, written by Puzzle Headed Charge. Author note: This is not a happy chapter. I don't think any discussion of humanity, particularly one inspired by the Geneva Conventions, would be complete if it only focused on the good side of human nature. This chapter is about why we needed the treaties in the first place. I'm not planning on making anything in here crucial to the understanding of the plot of the overall story, so if you're not in the mood for the less than positive pursuits of man, you may definitely skip this. I figure that this is an important topic and I would be remiss if I didn't try to address it at least just this once. End of author note. You have been warned. The lieutenant both understood and didn't understand why he was there. Rationally, academically, he understood that he had violated standing orders and that the consequences of that was a court-martial. He had violated the rules and regulations and laws all the way up to the International Treaty, the Third Geneva Convention. Emotionally, morally, he did not understand why he had done anything wrong. He believed it was his duty, his purpose, to kill the enemy. He did not understand that there was a difference between killing an enemy who was fighting, resisting, or trying to kill him, and killing an enemy who had surrendered and was standing defensively and helplessly in an airlock. He thought of the panic in the aliens' hideous bug eyes when they'd heard the hiss beginning to depress. To him, it was just human enough to be gratifying. He thrashed, tried to hold on, beat desperately against the door, as though there was anything that they could do to escape their fate. As though... They could fight the void that was the vacuum. It had been funny to watch, to see that the weird lizard tails wiggling and coil and freeze in fantastic shapes as the frigid temperatures of interstellar space flooded in. It had been a game to guess which ones would keep moving the longest. He did not understand why playing such a game was wrong. His mother had taught him, when he and his brothers were young, that learning to hunt, that they must never shoot unless they were sure to kill, must never make an animal suffer. It was a rule that he'd followed faithfully. He would never dream of forcing a feeding being to feel pain. As a lask, were not feeding beings. They did not count. They had proven that they were not feeding beings. They were unworthy of consideration. They were things... They were things that had killed his brothers. The thought made the soundless screams of the dying Zelask even funnier, gave the light on edge, an intoxicating, soothing and burning edge, slicing through him like a whiskey gone down. He gave the odd sensation of perhaps severing something important, but he was too drunk on the memory of power throughout enjoying it to care. Who cared about anything in this hellhole of a world? He felt at once nothing and too much. He felt like crying and laughing. He did not think that his parents, and now, after the end of the trial, they would be left childless. He did not think of who or what, if anything, he would have to confront after the end of the trial. He had killed anything left in him that had not died with his brothers. Much of the trial passed in a blur of dull procedure. He wanted to speak his piece. Some little part of him was firmly convinced that all of this would go away once he judges understood. But his lawyer said no. His lawyer argued for everything wrong. He said he was insane. He was destroyed. His brothers were dead. He should go to a hospital, not a prison. But he was not insane. They gave him tests, unnecessary tests. He knew it wasn't his sanity that had been lost. In the end, the judges agreed. For the unlawful execution of 47 Zelaska-accredited stellar free personnel classified under the International Law of Prisoners of War entitled to the privileges and protections of the Geneva Convention by the cruel and unusual method of exposing them to the vacuum of an airlock, this court-martial sentences Lieutenant Mitchell A. Kelly to hang by the neck until dead. He did not think of his parents. He was no longer even thinking of his brothers. He was thinking of the blue lizard. It must have liked the shrimpy one it stood next to. It had tried so hard to shield it, to give it some measure of protection from the depress. It had been as successful as it could at such a futile task. The shrimpy one had wiggled on along after the blue one went still. 
It did not occur and told the tenant that the blue one it had been trying to save was his younger brother. There were no such things as brothers for the lieutenant anymore. The guard came and asked him what he wanted for his last meal. He'd be fed the dinner, but not breakfast. He'd depart the universe before breakfast was served. He requested an MRE. He was a soldier. His last meal would be a soldier's meal. He didn't understand why the guard looked disgusted. The chaplain came, seeking to save this poor young man's soul. After a few minutes of talking about sin and remorse and forgiveness, the chaplain realized that he was wasting his words. He didn't know if it was because the lieutenant had no soul to save, or if it was because he did not want to be saved. The lieutenant had gloried in his cruelty and gleefully massacred 47 defenseless beings. Perhaps he wanted to go where the chaplain believed he was going. The lieutenant ate his last meal. It was so odd. He swallowed a bite and immediately forgot how it had tasted. So, by the end, he sat puzzled, wondering if he really had eaten it all, and went to sleep. His dreams would have been the other's wild nightmares, flights of cruelty and violence, and the absence of empathy that sometimes were hideous imaginings, sometimes only memories. He slept well and woke feeling rested. He looked with a ruthless pity on the man he used to be, who had lost sleep over how his men were faring, whether his brothers were safe. If his parents were worried, he always slept soundly now. It was a part of his liberation. The walk through the cool dawn air was unearthly. He was sad in a detached way that he was leaving the world, and all the interesting and pleasurable things in it. He felt the first violence of emotion when he realized he would be no longer be able to kill Zelask. He snarled to the guards about his mistake that they were making in the regard. The army needed men like him to do what needed to be done, to kill the enemy and make him suffer. The sight of the noose brought the first stirrings of the animal fear in his belly. They were ignored. He had long ago realized that he was mortal. This reminder now could barely sting when he was so numbed. The executioners were efficient and he knew their work. The knot was positioned correctly, and when the lieutenant's feet left the planks, his soul left the earth, chased by the snap of his neck. A nauseated doctor pronounced dead Lieutenant Mitchell A. Caddy, and two more of the millions of parents who had sent their children to war were bereft. The doctor shook his head. How can we do this? He whispered to himself. How? How can we do this? Better question. How could he do it, Doc? One of the executioners came up from behind him, surveying the corpse with impassive eyes. This dude murdered 47 people, and you're fussed about him. The doctor stood, turning to face the interlocutor. Do you have any idea how many beings are dying every day, at that moment, in refugee camps, anywhere either in military things is worth attacking? How, in the middle of all this, can we justify taking one more life? The executioner still appeared calm. Tell you why. Because it's the law. In my personal opinion, it's also justice. Though, I have some sympathy for the folks like you who think taking any life is wrong. The executioner shrugged. It is a nice idea, a naive one, but it has a honorable principle at its heart. Regardless, the law says that anyone who does what he did in the manner that he did it to receive the death penalty, and gets a hanging as a method of execution, so this is what we do with war criminals. This can't be justice, the doctor said softly. How could the destruction of a human life ever be anything but a crime? Why? Because it isn't pretty. The executioner laughed mirthlessly. Justice is ugly. The executioner continued on matter-of-factly. It is blind, unmovable, powerless in its own, fragile, apparently expensive. It is not even human. Justice, from its earliest conception, was believed to have come from the gods, the same terrifying, inscrutable deities who also send floods and fires and famines. It is also supposed to surpass our human nature, and as such is unfamiliar, unsatisfying, and even unnatural. Justice is loved and feared and hated and fought for like a religion. The executioner paused and made a face. Everything that is good is ugly. Freedom is ugly as hell. Nothing but people scrapping at each other over what God to pray to and what counts as an offense and how loud they can be on a Saturday night. Hope is uglier. 
It keeps you throwing yourself into the fire long after you could have lain down in peace. Life encompasses all of these, so that makes that the ugliest of all. The executioner suddenly smiled. Thing is, everything that has anything to do with humans is a dual nature. That things like justice and hope and life have existed all. That they survive and spread and become stronger is beautiful. That we conceive of justice at all. We, you are animals, in the strongest of miracles. How beautiful is it that we should realize a distinction between the right and wrong and choose the right. The executioner's hand spread in a gesture of futility or finality. What you've seen here today is the worst of humanity, breaking itself on the best of humanity. That we can stand to continue to pass justice when it is so ugly, so terrible, makes it beautiful. It makes humanity, for all of its flaws and fadings, beautiful. The sun broke over the horizon. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.